Hi, this is Jonathan Gardner. We're covering section 443 of Griffith's uh, Introduction to Electrodynamics, second edition. If you have questions or comments, you can put them in a video response with the comments below. And as always, if, uh, if I go too fast, you can just rewind and watch it again. And so let's get started. So, energy in a dielectric system. So, to charge a capacitor up to potential V, the amount of work you require is one half C V squared. We found this earlier back in chapter two. Um, if the capacitor is filled with a linear dielectric, well, the charge, the work you need to do is equal to K times the, the capacitance of something in a vacuum squared. And the, the reason why it takes more work um, is because you have to put more charge on the plates. It's pretty obvious to get the same potential that you had before because that dielectric will, will basically nullify a little bit of that field. Um, that was back in example six that we found that the capacitance varies by the constant dielectric constant K. Back in chapter two we had this equation to uh, calculate the amount of work it takes to assemble a system of charges. So we take the electric field everywhere times the volume component, and multiply, add them all together, and we take the epsilon naught over two of that, and that's the total work to put all the charges together one at a time. In the case of the dielectric field capacitor, um, this does not look like that, okay? Not quite exactly. Instead, it looks like we should have the work is equal to one uh, epsilon naught over two times the new dielectric field squared um, d tau, right? Because the electric field is reduced, it doesn't take as much work to build it up um, for the same um, thing. And this epsilon naught ke times one of these e, well that's just d. Okay, so now we have this new equation to give us the amount of work it takes to to charge up or to configure a uh, system of dielectrics. Okay, this is the old one, no dielectrics. This is the new one, now that we have dielectrics with the um, stranger field. Okay, so um, to prove this, it's, uh, it's not terribly difficult to prove this. It does involve product rule number five. So hopefully you're not playing some drinking game with that. So the, the amount of work, the small amount of work it takes to move a small amount of free charge uh, is basically this much. Okay, so you basically, how much, what's the potential at the point you're putting that at and where is the, the charge going to? Well, the divergence of D is equal to the free charge, right? It's that guy right there. And so the divergence of the small change in D will give you, of the small change in D, will give you the small change in the free charge. This is confusing. This is the small change in. This is the NAMBLA del operator thing. Okay, so now we plug that in here. So we get that is equal to the divergence of a small change in D uh, times the potential in whatever area they, are, they exist at. So this is across all space. So product rule number five, the divergence of a um, vector times a scalar is equal to, and let's write this over here, so the divergence of a small change in d vector times of the potential, which is a scalar field, that is going to equal the divergence of, well let's calculate the divergence of the small change in d vector and then multiply by v, and then we can add the small change in d dot with the gradient of the potential. Okay, did I get enough parentheses there? I did. So let's plug that back in. So we get the small amount of work it takes to move that small to make that small change in the d field is going to be nabla dot. Um, I feel like I'm skipping something, but I'm not. 
no, I am skipping something, blah, blah, blah. So this guy is this guy right here. So we have this minus that. Is that correct? It's got to be. Yes, I am so correct. Don't try to convince me otherwise. D tau. And then he has a plus. Well, I'm just going to write this out. Minus this guy. Okay, well, what's the guy on the left? So the guy on the left um, is a volume integral of a divergence, which we can translate to the surface integral of the boundaries of the entire space of this thing. These are dotted together. Well, out at infinity, the d vector tends towards zero. The potential is zero, so this just goes to zero. So this first term just blows away, okay? Well, negative, the gradient of v is just the e vector, so that's a small change in d vector, dot the e vector, I'm adding this, d tau, and we're back to where we started. So, um, let's calculate what this is. So, over here we're going to have, what if we had one half, small change in d vector, dot e vector, and um, that is going to be one half of a small change in, well, d dot e. d is just epsilon e, right? So epsilon e squared. And that is going to be epsilon, pull the epsilon out, times, where did my one half go? Anyway, it disappeared somewhere. Um, small change in e vector, dot another e vector, the e vector that was there originally. And so that is equal. What? This doesn't make any sense. No, this does make sense. And that is just basically epsilon. That is just the, the small change in the d vector, dot the e vector. So if I'm not very careful, this one I have to. So you're taking this, which is this term right here. Is that what I get? That's what I get. Okay, so this is this guy. And so we can replace it with this. A small change in the d vector dot the e vector. Okay. And so you add up all the small changes, you get the work is equal to 1 half the integral over all space of the d vector dot the e vector d tau. So we just basically derived this formula uh, using product rule number 5 and this funky business right here. So you may wonder why you get two different equations for the amount of work to configure the system. They're certainly not equal. Um, and the reason why this one doesn't look like this one. Well, if you consider two ways to describe how much energy it takes to put the system together, one way is you basically take the entire world and you freeze it. Nothing can move. And then you take tweezers and you move the charges one by one, ignoring how the system responds to the charges. And then once you're done, you unfreeze it and everything should balance. It shouldn't move at all, right? And when you're doing that, um, then this is the right formula to use for that. Um, note that you, you didn't include, when you're moving these charges around, the stretching that has to happen in the dielectric to produce that polarization that gives you that D field that's different than the E field, right? So the second way you can do this is you can take you can take uh, the free charges, which is usually what you have to move with it at first, and move the free charges into place one at a time and figure out how much it works to place each one. As you're doing this, just like with conductors before, uh, just like conductors before, for free you're getting the work it takes to, um, you know, create the bound charge and the and and the the bound, you know, volume charge and surface charge. Basically, you're stretching the dielectric as you do this. So, if you if you really want to think about it, you can think of the total work that has to be done is the amount of work it takes to put the free charges into place, <coughs> the amount of work to put the bound charges in place, plus the amount of work to stretch the dielectric, okay? Um, 
these last two basically cancel each other out, okay? Because the free charges induce a springiness that produces a bound charge, okay? So really the best way to look at the system is how much work does it take to place the free charge? That's really what we want to think about. That's generally what you want to think about. Um, um, when you try to apply this function, however, to certain scenarios that are strange, like electrets, you're going to get nonsense results. The reason why is because you're not taking into account the fact that when the things stretch, there's some friction going on. There's some like, basically the reason why electrics work in the first place is because they're, they're not linear. They produce a polarization even in the presence of no electric field. They start off without a polarization, you bring electric charges in and it stretches it and it basically changes the system, like there's some friction that happens there as well, so that when you remove the electric charge, it retains its polarization. And so in those cases, you get some kind of nonsense result if you try to use this equation. Anyway, I um, hope this helps, and I hope you do well um, uh, with the homework problems that come up next that uh, you know should definitely be attempted and struggled with. And I hope this is all you need. Take care. If you have any questions, be sure to add it in the comments or the questions below. Thanks. Bye.